In Alexandria, another Ptolemy was crowned king of Egypt in 246 BC. Ptolemy III was a conqueror. He traveled the world and returned to Alexandria with priceless Egyptian treasures stolen by the Persians 300 years before. This act of restoration earned the third Ptolemy the title of benefactor. Under his reign, the tradition of learning thrived in Alexandria for another generation. About 235 BC, the honorable position of chief librarian was filled by Eratosthenes. In keeping with tradition, the influential scholar also served as tutor to the royal family. 40-year-old Eratosthenes was skilled in a variety of subjects from poetry to science. Eratosthenes is the first one to figure out the circumference of the Earth. Now, it's important to note, but we were all taught in school that Columbus is the one who showed that the Earth was round. Educated Greeks knew that the Earth was round well before Columbus. Even in one of Socrates' dialogues, he says, when we describe the Earth, we know that it's a sphere suspended in the heavens. So it was known that the Earth was round. The question is, how big was it? By observing shadows cast in Alexandria and in the south of Egypt at noon on the same day, and calculating the difference between the size of each shadow and the distance between the two ancient cities, Eratosthenes was able to figure out the circumference of the Earth. He said the Earth was 24,650 miles around. Amazingly, he was accurate to within roughly 200 miles. A contemporary of Eratosthenes, called Archimedes, was a visitor to Alexandria. Perhaps the most celebrated of ancient mathematicians, Archimedes studied weights and measures in what we now call physics. Archimedes' principle on water displacement is still referred to today. On discovering this ancient clue to modern science, Archimedes is remembered for his cry of Eureka, meaning, I have found it. On leaving Alexandria, Archimedes returned to his homeland in Syracuse, Sicily, to continue his studies and inventions. When Syracuse was conquered in 212 BC, Archimedes was killed by Roman soldiers. He was said to be in the midst of a math problem when he was taken away to die. The library in Alexandria was thriving around 250 BC, while the rest of the world was making landmark strides as well. In the mid-3rd century BC, the Mayan calendar was perfected in the Mexican region of Yucatan. While in Rome, the public witnessed the first competition of gladiators. And in Rhodes, another ancient wonder was built as construction was completed on the 100-foot statue, Colossus. At the height of its popularity, scores and scores of high-level mines came through Alexandria. But over time, the luster of the library began to fade. The reign of the fourth Ptolemy marked the beginning of the decline of the dynasty and of the library. Other world centers of knowledge emerged as replacements. Near the Aegean Sea, the library at Pergamum was a rival to Alexandria in culture and splendor. And as the influence of the Romans spread out through the world, even Egypt's great Ptolemaic dynasty came under the threat of Roman rule. In 48 BC, when the Roman general Julius Caesar came to Egypt, the ruler of the land was 19-year-old Queen Cleopatra. 
Cleopatra is perhaps the most famous and fabled of all the Ptolemies. The mythology surrounding Cleopatra begins with her very heritage. We often think of her as an Egyptian. No, she was a pure-blooded Greek. She was the direct descendant of that Ptolemy who was one of Alexander's field commanders. She was the undoubted pharaoh, the god queen of Egypt. She had high intellect and was quite an extraordinary person by any standards. Cleopatra faced Julius Caesar without fear. Although Caesar came to conquer Egypt, Queen Cleopatra instead claimed Caesar's heart. On their first meeting, she was said to have emerged naked before him and disarmed the brilliant Roman with her charming manner and political savvy. For beyond her seductive nature, Cleopatra possessed admirable military skills and a keen intelligence. The important thing is that Cleopatra was really an intellectual. Of, the, of all the Ptolemies, Cleopatra was the only one who could speak Egyptian. It was known that she could greet the people who came to her court in their own languages. And probably when Caesar came and when Antony came, she could talk to them in Latin. So Cleopatra would have had an active interest in the library, almost certainly, as an intellectual. There are even traditions that Cleopatra wrote works which might have been in the library. It was during the reign of Cleopatra that we may discover the first clues to the beginning of the destruction of the great library at Alexandria. When Cleopatra struggled for rulership of Egypt against her co-ruler and brother, Caesar sided with Cleopatra and found himself embroiled in an Alexandrian civil war. But Caesar's navy was no match for the fine Alexandrian vessels and soon he was surrounded in the harbor. Caesar found himself encircled, resorted to the use of fire, and he set fire in the enemy's ships. The fire destroyed ships at sea and in the docks, and here the account of Caesar himself stops. A century later, we have more details that the fire was not limited to the ships, but extended to the closer parts of the city, near to the harbor. And Plutarch, who knew Alexandria very well, and who visited Alexandria, says that the fire extended from the docks to the great library of Alexandria. According to the ancient historian Plutarch, the library was accidentally destroyed by a fire which spread from the harbor. But some modern historians believe the fire destroyed warehouses containing only a portion of the Alexandrian scroll collection. Did the library of Alexandria rise from the ashes to continue its tradition of teaching? After Caesar's death in 44 BC, his successor, Mark Antony, offered Queen Cleopatra thousands of books purchased from the rival library at Pergamon. This offering was perhaps made to replace the books burned by Caesar. Mark Antony, like Caesar before him, sided with Cleopatra against the opposition in Alexandria. But in 31 BC, the two were defeated at the Sea Battle of Actium. Mark Antony committed suicide, and his lover, Queen Cleopatra, soon followed suit. Legend tells us she placed a snake to her breast, and soon after being bitten by the asp, succumbed to its poison and died. More probably, Cleopatra drank a poison which killed her. But whatever the cause, Ptolemaic dynasty, which had founded and funded the Library of Alexandria, ended with the death of Cleopatra in 30 BC. If civil war in Alexandria and the demise of a dynasty could not destroy the tremendous library, what could? With the end of Ptolemaic rule in 30 BC, 
Alexandria became the capital of a Roman province claimed by the grand-nephew of Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, who was the first Roman emperor. By then, Alexandria was home to more than 300,000 people. The city itself enjoyed a resurgence of energy, which had been absent in the last half century. But under Roman influence, the library did not flourish as it had in the past. 